That was heavy, y'all. This thing's weighing in at about 40 pounds. It holds five gallons of water, which is as much as what's coming out of your shower head in two minutes. Think of how much water you'd use if you had to fetch it yourself. I have been a self-proclaimed water nerd since 2009 when I took a job with Environment Texas. If you ever want to see how thick your skin really is, staying on a busy sidewalk, holding a clipboard, asking people if they have a moment to talk. It's a dead giveaway I'm asking you for something. I got completely ignored, I got no's, I got rude comments, awkward advances, and the occasional sure what's up. I turn that question around on them and ask, do you know what's up with your drinking water? That summer, I learned how few people really knew where their water came from. And that's where it all began. I read and researched how we get water from here to there, balancing pH, sewer overflows. I was fascinated by all things water. I could have never expected how complex the resource really is. Fast forward seven years, I was working at a nonprofit managing a water science field trip program and engaged to my long-term boyfriend, Patrick. Our neighbors got this idea to travel by bicycle. And they were thinking van life, but realized gas is pretty expensive when you don't have a job. After a little convincing, we decided to join them. So we quit our jobs, we sold most of our stuff, and we hit the road. Now, if you don't know what self-supported bike touring looks like, that's fine. We didn't either. <laughs> it looks a little something like this. But most of the time, you're actually pretty exhausted, so it looks like this. So we were carrying our camping gear, our clothes, our food, our water. Not all five gallons and 40 pounds like this, but our friends, they got bored after about two months. Patrick and I, we were hooked. Traveling at this slow, intimate pace helped me deeply connect with water management. So we started a YouTube channel where we were sharing our journey, like down the Western Colorado River, where 40 million people get their drinking water from a river compact that goes back to 1922. By the time the river actually reaches the ocean, there's just a trickle left. We followed it down into Mexico, and we couldn't believe there was no water. So we thought there were times where we needed to carry 40 pounds of water on our bikes in the desert, but I wasn't about to load that much weight on there. So extreme conservation was the only option. We kept pedaling and pedaling, eventually down through Mexico to Cabo San Lucas. We flew with our bicycles all the way to Hawaii. Now, I had never been that far from home before. It's supposed to be paradise, right? We cycled two islands. Most tourists, they hang out on the drier leeward side. Turns out it takes a thousand years for rain to fill the aquifer back up. Then on the more wet windward side, residents are dealing with water quality problems and drought. So Hawaii is pushing extreme conservation. I just thought even Hawaii has water problems? Okay, now at this point, we were seasoned road warriors. We thought, if we're talking water, let's do the big one. The world's fourth largest river basin, the mighty Mississippi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we started in central Minnesota and cycled all the way down to New Orleans, Louisiana. Along the way, we interviewed utilities, farmers, the Army Corps of Engineers, and even boarded state agencies' research boats. 
that's when we learned that Memphis, Tennessee, the largest city on the river, doesn't use one drop from there. That blew my mind. Turns out there is this massive sand aquifer deep below ground that supplies all of our water needs. So we decided to interview the lead researcher at the University of Memphis. But we still had 500 miles left to pedal, so our minds, they moved on quickly. When we got down through the delta, it felt like this land that once was. The river can no longer deposit rich sediment. Instead, it's flushed out forcefully into the Gulf of Mexico, where 41% of our country's landscape drains. By the time we got to New Orleans, we were tired, deeply tired. We pedaled 8,000 miles, and we realized just how strained our water resources really are. Plus, we were broke at that point. So we got on a train back to Texas, but forever changed. These problems are so big. I turned inwards. I wanted to escape. I kept thinking about images like this. And then two sudden deaths, two significant women in my life died unexpectedly within weeks of each other. Everything felt broken, everything felt hopeless. 30 million Americans live in areas where water systems violate health and safety laws. Our nation's water infrastructure has a rating of D. And on average, every year, 5,000 square miles of the Gulf of Mexico turns into the dead zone, where there's little oxygen, fish die off, and toxic algae plagues coastal communities. Water wasn't making me feel weightless. Felt like I was carrying this bucket of worries around on my back. Out of the blue, I get a call from that researcher we interviewed in Memphis with an opportunity to apply for a job at the research center. Knowing the source of Memphis's water, how unique it is, I felt this pull I just couldn't quite understand. And Patrick agreed. All right, let's do it. Let's move to Memphis. <laughs> and we're here now. So this aquifer system, y'all, it is part of a massive system that spans nine states. It supplies some of the highest quality H2O in the entire country. And our crit critically acclaimed Memphis Sand Aquifer made it to national headlines in the fight against the Bahalia Connection Pipeline. Yeah. This pipeline, crude oil pipeline, was planned to route directly through a municipal well field where water was pumped and sent to homes in the predominantly black southwest Memphis. Then it was going to be routed through our recharge zone where rainwater replenishes our supply. And on top of all that, the company attempted to use the power of eminent domain to take away the homes of people that didn't want to sell. Now, not everybody in Memphis can define aquifer, but they know they've got something good. And so people decided to take arms and learn, learn a lot, armed with science, law, raw emotions, and common sense. People took action. And eventually, the Bahia Connection Pipeline was pulled. <laughs> people become intimately connected to their community and to the environment when they know the basic facts of where their water comes from. It's a tangible thing. Water's been this always available, ordinary resource, resource but it won't always stay that way. We have to treat it with attention, care, and innovation. I truly believe no matter what industry you're in, we need to reset our relationship to water. If Memphis was unaware, nobody would have acted, and that pipeline would be in the ground today. So the question that keeps moving me forward, 
the one that we all need to ask ourselves is, what's up with our drinking water? Cheers, y'all.